Hey, it's Jackie from the 40 Thrive Podcast. Before we get started, I want to invite you to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to this show. That way, each episode will magically appear in your favorite podcast app, and you'll never have to search for it again. If you don't know how to subscribe, hit me up at hello at 40thrive.com and I'll help. All right, now let's do this thing. You're listening to the 40 Thrive Podcast, the show created for women 40 and beyond, ready to shake things up. And now, your host, Jackie McDougal. Welcome to another episode of the 40 Thrive Podcast. If you're a parent living in an empty or almost empty nest, this episode is for you. Today on the podcast, I talk with Lisa Heffernan. Lisa's had a long career working on Wall Street, in politics and writing. She's a New York Times bestselling author of three books, including Goldman Sachs, The Culture of Success. But for the past few years, Lisa served as co-founder of Grown and Flown, a brand that started as a website she created with her business partner, Mary Dell Harrington, earning them the title of People Magazine's 25 Women Changing the World in 2017 pretty cool. In the midst of guiding their own kids through this crazy transition, they launched what has become the largest website and online community for parents of 15 to 25 year olds. Now they've compiled new takeaways and fresh insights from all that they've learned into a handy must have guide. The grown and flown book is about to hatch. Grown and Flown is a one-stop resource for parenting teenagers leading up to and through high school and those first years of independence. It covers everything from the monumental how to let your kids go to the mundane how to shop for a dorm room. Organized by topics like academics, anxiety and mental health, college life, it features a combination of stories, advice from professionals, and practical sidebars. You should basically consider this your parenting lifeline, an easy to use manual that offers support and perspective. You can pre-order the book that's coming out very, very soon. Just check out the show notes at 40thrive.com forward slash episode 36 for the link to that. Or you can get the audiobook for free with a free month of Audible. I absolutely love consuming the audio version of books. I can listen when I'm driving my kids or walking the dogs or even doing laundry, which seems never ending. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash 40 thrive and receive a free audio download, which you can use on the grown and flown book and a free month of audible. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash 40 thrive. So go get that book right after you listen to this conversation I had with Lisa Heffernan. Lisa, welcome to the 40 thrive podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I realize I'm the last person to the party grown and flown is like the biggest thing out there. And how did I not know about it? Thank you for that. (laughs) Um, A few people who don't know, but um, certainly for moms uh, and dads, but mostly moms of, uh, teenagers and college kids were kind of a big community and a very dynamic one. Yeah. And so I joined, I have a 15 year old. There you go. So he's my oldest. So I have 15, almost 14 and 12. And what a gift, first of all, to see what people are going through, how they're sharing, how these people support each other through what is quite a difficult time in parenting, I have to say. It really is. The stars misalign, if I can put it that way, all at once. So we reach the stage of your kid going to high school, let's call it. So that's 14 or 15, depending on the kids. And suddenly your experts begin to disappear. So you don't talk to your pediatrician because your kid goes into the pediatrician's appointment by themselves and you know talks privately to their doctor. And you're not really supposed to talk to their teachers. That's up to them to do, and, and rightly so. You don't talk to their coaches. So all the experts for who've really been sort of your partners in parenting along the way begin to disappear. At the same time, your kid begins to take public transportation or has a little bit more independence or turns 16 and learns to drive. And the parents that you used to talk to about all the issues begin to disappear also because you're not dropping off at a play date. Your kid goes over to another kid's house and hangs out, right? That you've moved on to that stage. So here you are suddenly facing some of the most complicated and certainly the most consequential parenting issues. And everybody's kind of disappeared and you're on your own. 
Um, and so we thought it might be terrific to start a community where people would feel far less on their own and know that their issues are shared by so many other parents. It's such a good point because, you know, coming from the blogger space a million years ago, and I think that you've been in this world for a long time, that's exactly right. Like you turn on the Today Show or Good Morning America and it's like, you know, you get all the parenting advice in the world, but they hit a certain age and it's like, oh, we can't talk about it. It's too painful. We don't want to tell the people who are coming up how painful it can actually be. So take us back to the beginning. How did it all happen? Okay. Well, uh, I co-founded the site for Grown and Flown. Everything's called Grown and Flown in our ecosystem um, with my business partner, Maradell Harrington. Um, at the time, our kids were in high school and college. Our youngest were either in ninth grade or 10th grade. And we were feeling just lost. We were feeling like, as you say, there was nothing out there. Our kids had been born in the 90s. And for parents who'd had their kids in the 90s, we largely consulted books because there weren't so many websites. But now we'd all gone digital and there was nothing talking about teens. And the kids were having more and more complex issues. And their issues were more private. It's harder to talk about your kid cheating. It's harder to talk about your kid getting a DUI. It's harder to talk about your kid's anxiety or depression than it is the fact that, you know, they're a picky eater. You know, everyone has right. a picky eater. What's the deal? So you're at this stage where you're dealing with a lot of really complex things. And many of the things that are happening are setting the direction for the rest of their lives. And that, you know, the choices that they're making that you're helping them make. And there's no one to talk to. So we threw a couple blog posts up. Um, which I wrote largely about my own kids. And we started a website and it just gained traction. I think not because we were so wonderful, but because like so many other things in life, being in the right place at the right time is more important than anything. So people began to gravitate to us and we opened up the community, which is the Facebook group that you're talking about. We now have 500 writers on the site. So it is no wow. longer the Lisa and Mary Dell show. Yeah. So I have three boys and a very small little slice of life living here north of New York. And we really wanted to cover the gamut of parenting. So we wanted a much broader set of experiences and we brought in experts. So we have psychologists and physicians and educators and people who deal with kids professionally as well as in their own homes. That's amazing. Because, you know, one of the things, and I'm sure you've seen this for many years, but on social media, we tend to go, oh, my kid got into this college, or my kid did this, and my kid did that. I have a friend who wrote a Facebook post about her son got into community college. And you know what? It was a struggle even to get him there. And she's like, I'm celebrating. And I just loved the honesty and the ability to kind of open up the doors to other people saying like, yeah, sometimes them getting out of bed and being productive that day is a victory. Exactly. Particularly when some of the biggest problems this generation are dealing with are anxiety and depression. So you're, yes. you're spot on saying getting out of bed and you know putting one foot in front of the other and getting on with their day. Last night, so we do anonymous posts in our group. And I will mm -hmm. tell you, last night I put in uh, two I put in many, but two I'll tell you about. I put in one of a mom who came to the group and said that her son wants a gender change. He wants to transition. And she doesn't know anyone else having that experience. It's an uncommon enough experience that wherever she lives, and I don't know, she may live in a small town, she doesn't personally know people who've been through that experience, but she needs the help of other parents who've been down this road, either in their own personal lives or many times professionally working with teens. So she comes to the group and she finds support. She finds insight. She finds other people's experience. People gave her websites to go to, things to think about. And, and a lot of, you know, pats on the back for being the mom who was looking to be the best parent possible and just was a little bit lost because she was experiencing something so new to her. We put in another post yesterday about a mom whose kid had just come out to her and she was just feeling lost. She just didn't know enough people who she could talk to in her real life. So she came into the group and there are dozens and hundreds of parents who've had the same experience and can give you the insights that that experience has brought them. So that's what we don't get in the teen years. And that's what so many of us need. Absolutely. And the thing is, whether your child is coming out or transgender or going through something else, like we are pretty savvy moms that we can find the experts sometimes where we need them or make the appointment. But sometimes that's not enough for a mom to go out and say to another mom, have you walked this mile in these shoes? Because I really could use a little bit of support, not just the expert support, 
but the other support of other people who might be afraid of what's to come, it's priceless. We all just know a handful of people. So we're in any given experience, whether your kid is, I have three boys and my sons, I've got good kids. They all totaled our cars in a very short period of time, which when you look at the data on teenage boy drivers, it's not as big a surprise as you think. But you kind of want to talk to other people and say, did you feel comfortable letting your kid get back in the car after they told your car and the car they hit? Did you feel that they were a good enough driver? Did you feel that, you know, what, what happened after an experience like that? Certainly that's a more common experience than some of the ones we're talking about. But you need to be able to talk to those other parents who've already been through what, you, what you're going through right then. Yeah. And it's really hard because, you know, how many times do we see if your kid had a disease or a disorder or something, you'd, you know, talk about it and you get the support. But then when, if your child has mental illness, if your child has anxiety or depression, like it feels like one of those secrets that you keep. Well, and some of it is privacy also. We need help dealing with these problems. We need help guiding and mentoring our kids. But this is their story. You know, it's one yes. thing when we were struggling to get them out of diapers. You know, you're two years old. There's only so much privacy you get. But when you're 17 and your mom, and this has happened to us, moms have written in from the admitting department, you know, where a kid is being admitted for psychiatric observation in a hospital, they need help, but it isn't their story to tell. It isn't their story to go and tell the entire world that their 17-year-old, that their 15-year-old is needing some psychiatric care, but they need guidance. So a a forum like this or, or a group like this allows people to find that. You're absolutely right. So I used to do some parenting writing for Disney and HuffPo. And I stopped blogging about my kids at a certain age because I realized that my stories were no longer mine. They were their stories. And it just it started to feel wrong. So I can imagine even more so as they become their own adults. We have no right to be sharing their stories out there publicly. So you're absolutely right. That's the problem. And that's why there aren't as many sites. And that's actually why we've written the book, also called Grown and Flown, because we call everything Grown and Flown. <laughs> well, as you um, should. Exactly. Because there just isn't that much out there telling truthful, honest stories with insights from experts about parenting this age, as I said, at the exact moment when we need it the most. Right. And so you made the perfect transition into the book. Congratulations, by the way. What can we expect from the book that is different from the website and the group? Basically, in the book, we tried to answer the questions that we hear people asking all the time. So we went out and got experts to talk about the things that mattered to our parents and that we know are on our parents' minds. And we've organized it not so much chronologically, but by topic. So there's a whole, there's a section on family life. So it's all the issues around sibling fighting, about how we keep our families close as our kids grow and grow away from each other, grow away from each other, grow away from us, a chapter on health and a chapter on mental health and happiness. So we sat down with the, there's two professors who teach the most popular class at NYU called the science of happiness. And we sat down with them and said, you work with undergraduates every single day. Tell a high school parent how they can best help a kid psychologically transition into college. We know that about 65% of kids are quite homesick when they get to college. Many, many kids feel a bit lost, a bit unsteady. Those of us who've gone to college can remember that it's kind of a big leap academically. So we sat down with professors and asked them, you know, from your point of view in the front of the classroom, what makes it work best? Um, We sat down with another professor and asked her, what happens when kids get into academic difficulty? What do you advise them? Because as a parent, we don't actually know. It's been a long time since we sat in a college classroom. There's a lot more resources for kids. We sat down with experts and we sat down with knowledgeable parents and tried to answer the questions that we hear most often for parents of 15 to 25-year-olds. And we put it between two covers or actually flat iron, put it between two covers for us. (laughs) So what would you say, can you give us a sneak peek? Is there something like a tidbit or two that maybe surprised you as far as the answers? Yes. The thing that I have to say, the overarching theme that surprised me is we're not actually helicopter parents. Helicopter parents, yeah, no. That's like a great headline. There are a small number of people who are helicopter parents and they get a lot of play and the rest of us are just doing our best. We are not. There was a great survey out in the New York Times last March, which talked about all these things that parents do for their kids. And some of the most egregious were like talking to your kid's boss, calling your kid's professor, helping your kid do an assignment or like really not just listening to them, but like actually helping them do the assignment. And the numbers were under 10% for those kinds of mm. behaviors. So what this says to me is that 90% of us know that's over the line. You don't do that. 
you can sit and do a maybe a practice interview with your kid. You can say to them, have you thought about these questions you might get asked in your interview? Do you want me to proofread your resume? But you don't call them your boss. I think it's about 4 or 5% call their boss, which means 95% of us know what not to do, which means most of us really are not helicopter parents. But here's why, partly why we think we're helicopter parents. We think it because there's a lot of press around it. So the 10% are getting the airspace and the 90% of us are... I mean, what kind of a headline is it? 90% of parents aren't helicopter parents. Like, right. who would write that? But the second <laughs> reason that we're confused is we have a fundamentally different relationship with our teenagers and our young adults than we had with our own parents. And the data is showing this so clearly. They like us more. Yay. They want to talk to us more. They value our opinion. They want to be with us more. So all of this communication that's been technologically enabled we're being told is somehow us being too involved in their lives. Well, when your kid texts you and says, mom, what does that light mean on the dash? And should I stop driving the car or should I just go to a gas station or can I get home with it? That's not helicoptering. That's advising. That's mentoring. If your kids, one of the rules of thumb that we suggest to people is, would you do this for somebody else's kid? So if your best friend's daughter called you and said, Lisa, Jackie, I see this light on the dash. My mom isn't home. I don't know what to do. Would you say to her, figure it out yourself? Or would you say, don't worry about it, dear. There's a thing in the glove compartment. You can look in there or you can go on your phone and search your car. And, you know, you'd walk them through it. So that's right. advising and mentoring. That is not helicoptering. And we've conflated those two things a bit. And it's because of the technology. It's so new and it's so fundamentally changed things. We can't look at our own experiences as teenagers and think, what would my parents do? That's no longer relevant. Our parents wouldn't have done anything. <laughs> Our parents let us go to college and they never, they spoke to us once. They'd say, what did you do to the car that the light came on? <laughs> exactly. So we're trying to find our feet because it's a new kind of parenting with a different generation. And we got a really bad label and it got really overused. So if I got one takeaway to give people, it's we're doing a much better job than you would think we were doing. And the evidence is all there. This is such a well-behaved generation. They drink less, they use fewer drugs, they have less unprotected sex, they have fewer unwanted pregnancies. They put us to shame. This is some good parenting going on. Well, I think, you know, first of all, that's great news. Yeah. <laughs> but secondly, I feel like the communication has changed that, you know, at one point in our generation, we weren't necessarily taught a lot of things that maybe we <laughs> would have been helpful. I don't know about sex or money or, you know, just everyday grown up adulting, it feels like it flipped, the pendulum swung the other way, the calling the boss, the whatever it is. So do you feel like, you know, it's sort of swung back in the middle, and that parents understand the value of teaching them how to be independent while supporting them along the way? Yes, I think parents understand that. There's been some great writing around that subject. Jess Leahy, he's got a fantastic book out called The Gift of Failure, which people have very much absorbed the ideas of her book. But I think in part, a small number of people went crazy and we couldn't believe what they were doing and they got a lot of attention. I think the vast majority of parents still were not doing these crazy things because it's just common sense told them, you don't call your kid's professor. You have a conversation with your kids that says, have you talked to your professor? Maybe you should go see your professor. Do you know when office hours are? Right. You're guiding and advising, but you are not doing. You were there to right. listen. You're there to be a sounding board. You're there to have somebody that they can say almost anything to. What a liberating thing for a kid to know that there's somebody there that when something's troubling them, they can sort of dump it. Lisa Damore, who wrote Under Pressure and Untangled, calls it dumping your emotional trash. And I think your, your listeners might know this, where your kid comes in, like dumps their drama on you, and then they're somehow better for having done that. They feel like they've dumped <laughs> emotional trash on you, and then they go about their day. You know, that's fine. That's we're parents. Yeah. It's, it's okay. It is, it is, there's something sort of wonderful if a kid feels that they can tell you those things that are really bothering them. And that, that itself is just sometimes the solution. You didn't need to do, often we don't need to do anything, but just hear them out. It's so true. How do you then deal with some of the emotional trash that they dumped without rocking back and forth in the fetal position? I know. Sometimes oh, the worst is when they call you and dump their emotional trash. And then, oh, they, man. and then they don't tell you that they solved the problem. So, you know, so-and-so broke up with me or I've had a huge fight with a friend or, and then it resolves itself an hour later and they don't tell you. And of course you worry for the next, you know, day until you hear from them. Um, right. You, you text and say, all good now. 
feeling better. <laughs> I often text my boys two words, all good, question mark. And if all I'm looking for back is, yeah, good. Just that, you know, just that tiny bit of temperature taking. You know what I feel the equivalent of? Do you remember when your kids were little and you took them to the park and they would go and play on the playground? Then they would run over and they would like touch your knee and then they would run back again. Yeah. It's like, mom, I just want to make sure you're still here. And like all of my support systems are here. Good. I can go back now and play by myself. I don't need you. I need you right. there. It's kind of still the same with teenagers. They don't, or, and young adults, they don't always need you, but they need to know you're there. And that right. is liberating and allows them to live their lives independently. With your kids, if you could go back 10 years, would you change how you raise them through teenage life and young adult life? I would love to do it all again. <laughs> it would be so much fun. <laughs> I guess the only thing I would do is in my mind, I would hold the thought, I need to teach them how they're going to do this on their own. Uh, you know, sometimes the temptation is to do it ourselves or just to assume that they're watching. And watching is good. I mean, kids learn by watching. That's, that's, that's a time-honored practice of teaching. But to almost talk through process sometimes. So let's go back to that silly example. But when I see that light, I go to the glove compartment and I get that book out. You can go online too, but we're old-fashioned. And I look up what the light says. And then I know whether I can have to take it in right away or whether it's, you know, not something that's an emergency talking through those processing, talking through my decision-making. I'll give you a good example. We take care of their health care. We talk about this a lot in the book. We're required to take care of their health care until they're 18. They cannot make their own decisions. I sent one of my kids to the pediatrician at 16 because he could drive already, and they wouldn't give him an immunization because I couldn't sign on it. They, they cannot authorize their own health care. What that means, though, is we do something wrong, which is that they have a symptom, we give them a remedy. We, we dole out medicine or we go to the drugstore and we buy medicine without them. And then we send them to college and they don't know what to do. Um, oh, one of my yeah. kids got sick, as they all do freshman year, and took two medications that were actually the same thing. He thought one was for cough and one was for runny nose. But, of course, what he had done is double dose because he did the, the cardinal sin, which is do not give kids multi-symptom remedies. So I would talk through those sorts of things. This is just an example, but you can imagine this in every aspect of life. I am giving you this because you have, you know, a runny nose, and this is the thing for runny noses. I'm not also going to give you something for cough because this is for that also. I would, just more teaching. We tend to just do things. We're all rushing. We've all got so right. much on our plates. It's much easier just to hand the kid the NyQuil or the whatever kids take and not explain without thinking, wow, 18 months from now, two years from now, he's going to have to decide when to take this. Not me. Yes, I'm going to be on the other end of the phone. Yes, he can text me and ask me. But I need to teach him this. And when I'm in CVS, this is not an advertisement for CVS. When I'm in <laughs> CVS, I need to say to him, I buy this one and not this one because I have found X, Y, and Z. So that when he's standing in the aisle at CVS freshman year, feeling absolutely miserable, he thinks, hmm, mom said to think about X, Y, and Z when I'm buying these things. That's what That's I That's a great point. More deliberate kind of showing them our thinking process and our decision-making process because they have to make those thinking processes and decision-making processes soon on their own. That's amazing. That's such a good tip. Last year when my oldest entered high school and I had one in high school, one in junior high and one in elementary school, I said, this is the year of becoming your own advocate. I'm not emailing teachers, I'm not getting involved. And so they will come to me or, you know, I still get the emails. I just wanted to make sure that the communication was clear and things like that. So they would CC me on communications with the teachers. But that was a teaching year, you know, and then as we get into 10th grade and 11th grade and 12th grade, I can pull back. And that's such a perfect way to do it. Because then you can say to him, I know you explained it to your teacher like X, but you might have confused her or you might not have been clear enough. And this is what I might have said. And you can think about next time you email her. When you say that exactly. to her, she might not know whether you mean this or this. Maybe you could think about a way to make yourself clearer to her. Exactly. Each and also time just it's teaching. The, yes. And the level of communication, because at first it was like, it was like they were texting their friends and like, there's no grammar, there's no, you know, punctuation or anything. And it's just like these random thoughts. And I'm like, no, you have to really form your thoughts. You need to create this. And, you know, if there are multiple thoughts, we're going to bullet point them or you know, things like that. Because ultimately, they'll be in a job and they're not going to have me calling the boss. But I'm a huge fan of teaching kids how to 
advocate for themselves. You know, a couple times there was a grade in the online grade book program there. This happened to both boys. They were like, that's not really the grade I got. And I said, well, you need to reach out. These teachers are human and they've got hundreds of students. So when they're doing grades or maybe they're tired, maybe whatever's going on, it's okay to reach out and say, I don't believe that this is the correct grade. Can you confirm? And both times it was, oh, you know what? I made a mistake. I either reverse the numbers or it was the wrong kid or whatever it was. And so they learned very quickly that if you communicate, if you communicate with manners and with respect, it's okay. And I mean, it's silly, but even when they were smaller and we'd be in a restaurant, if they got the wrong thing, you know, we were, I can only speak for myself, but it was kind of like, you got the wrong thing, just eat it anyway. (laughs) You know, you'll be all right. Just eat what you got. And I'm trying to teach them to say, oh, excuse me, I had asked for no cheese. Would you mind changing that? Like, use your manners, but it's okay to put yourself out there. It's okay to advocate for yourself. There's a way to say, to correct somebody that isn't confrontational and gets you what you want. And, and you know, and that, that like you say, that will go through to the job. That will go through you, the way you're going to talk to a professor. The way you're teaching your kids to talk to their high school teachers will help them when they talk to their professors. If you send a email that sounds like you're talking to another 20 year old, that's just so unimpressive to a professor. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I've noticed too that if you're on the cusp, you have a B plus and you're like a fraction of a point away from an A minus and, and you've you know, advocated for yourself, you've communicated, you walk into a classroom and you actually treat that teacher like they're a human being. It's amazing. <laughs> you know, and it's not, you don't do it for that extra point. But it's a give and take, you know, and I I see a lot when they do build those relationships with teachers. Exactly what you're saying. In her book, a professor says this to us. She says, you know, it's the students who I know who they are. They've been to office hours. Their grade is right on the edge. She said, I'm always looking to give them extra and, you know, to come down on the the more positive side for them because they've, not because you're, you know, sucking up or being, you know, obsequious, but because they put in the effort. And right. Professors and teachers like to reward effort. Yeah, I think human beings like to reward effort, you know. So let's, um, we, you know, we've talked about the kids here. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about the, I know, let's talk about the moms in the group. How has life changed for you outside of, you know, I just watched that movie Otherhood last night. It's on Netflix and, you know, they have grown sons and, you know, it wasn't the best movie in the world, I'll have to say. But it was interesting because there was one line in it where she said something like, you found out who you are without me. I Now I have to find out who I am without you. And so that kind of like gut punched me a little bit because <laughs> I know it's not that far off. So how has your life changed since kind of sending the boys out into the world? Well, it, it- Grown and flown has kind of taken over my entire life. So <laughs> I, I might have been able to answer that question a little more objectively if we hadn't started this, I don't even know what to call it, this website, this book, this this community. I think the thing that's changed is I had to figure out, and, and again, it goes back to the theme of the book, I had to figure out ways to keep in close contact with my kids that made me feel like I still knew them. One of the most popular pieces I wrote for this site was called Knowing My Sons a Little Less, which was about how it wasn't that I didn't want to let them go. And it wasn't that I didn't want them to be their own independent people. It's that I just didn't want to know them less. I still wanted to know them and be close to them. And if I could maintain that closeness and that love that our family, that families have, not my family, all families have, that was fine. That's what I was looking for. And I think that's what most parents are really looking for. I think, you know, experts will tell you, like, get a hobby or something. I don't think a hobby can replace a kid. It doesn't fill the spot. The thing that I try to tell parents when kids are going off is you are going to see and hear from them so much more than you think you are. You're extrapolating from your own experience of going off. And that is not the experience you're going to have as a parent. The experience you had as a college student is not the experience your college student's going to have. So we stay close to them. And we just try and remind women, like there's a really long, full life post kids. Like there's a whole second lifetime, essentially. You know, you're in your forties probably when your kids leave maybe in your early 50s. My mom is in her 80s and still working. I mean, that's, wow. that's, that's the model. That's where we're going because people are you know, staying healthy. And I'm going to tell your listeners right now, you're in your exercise clothes. <laughs> so people are staying <laughs> healthy and they're working out and they are going to you know, live much longer, healthier, more vibrant lives. So we were just trying to remind people there's a whole second career 
or a continuation of the career you're on after the kids have left uh, and you have a lot yeah. more time. I know most people continue their career while their kids are home, but you can really throw yourself into it when you don't have to, you know, feel like you have to rush home for them. What's interesting is we could sit here and talk about what the book and the community and the website are about. But in actuality, you started a new business. I mean, this is a business yeah. when you were well over 40. Yes, everybody should. Because it's so exciting to start something new in the middle of life. The career we pick in our 20s has a lot of functionality to it. You know, we need to pay bills. We've got student loans. We've got a family. You know, it's got a lot of functionality. We need to live in a certain city because of a spouse or because of family. There's all sorts of constraints that kind of box us into what we end up doing with our lives. And they're all good things. This is good stuff. This isn't the bad stuff. This is the good stuff. But everybody's constrained. Everybody's got reasons why they made compromises. That second thing that you do in your life is a lot more wide open. You know, the kids have moved on. They've gotten to where they need to get. There's a lot more flexibility in your life. So there's a lot more opportunity. And it's so exciting to do something in the middle of your life. It's like so novel in a good way. I suggest it to everybody, even if it's an avocation, even if it isn't a vocation, even if your vocation stays the same. Some new, really exciting project. It can be philanthropic or community, something you can really throw yourself into brand new in the middle of your life is a, it's a really fun thing. I hear all these women who start businesses, you know, over 50 in their 60s and how fulfilling it is because I think when you look at a career that's more aligned with who you are and where you are, it doesn't feel like a job anymore. Yeah. And we know ourselves so much better. I mean, the careers we picked at 22, you know, there's an extent. Some people I think have callings um, and they know. Many of us thought, I've got student loans. I've got rent. Mm, that salary covers it. We're good. You know, and it wasn't a deep, more profound decision. I think when you sit down and you think to yourself, you know, I'm 50 years old and I could work for another 30 years. Like that's a, just a lot of runway. People used to wind down their lives at that age. I think people are winding up their lives at that age. You found something that obviously there was a need you found a need in your own life. You saw the women around you. There was a need in their life. And then you built a business around it. Do you think it's just that easy? Or do you have advice for someone who maybe feels like they're ending, they're winding down that, that past life and looking to ramp up the next life and they have no idea how? I think a um, couple things. One is talk to every single person you can ever talk to. Um, there's a wonderful book called Meet 100 People. And this wonderful author writes about how if you take the time to meet a hundred different people and ask them about what they're doing and learn about it, it will open up so many new ideas in your mind that you've never thought of. And some of those people will say to you, can I introduce you to so-and-so who does this? Because you might find her interesting or you might find him interesting. Not in a grasping, you know, networking kind of way, but in a really learning kind of way. Because I'm a case in point, what I do right now and the career that I have right now didn't exist. I will tell you that the careers the two of my kids have didn't exist when they were in high school. And they're, one of them is only 23. It's such a new wow. field. And that's true for all of us. So the jobs and the opportunities and the way we work, literally like logistically the way we work, it could be at a WeWork. It could be remotely. It, the options are so different than anything they were. And if you've been working in the same career in the same industry for 20 or 25 years, you probably don't know them all. Because to be fair, we only know our own, we all only know our own worlds. So maybe you don't meet a hundred people, maybe you meet 12 people, but you sit down and have conversations with people, reach out to perfect strangers because people just like to talk and people are nice, fundamentally nice. Reach out to somebody and say, I'm looking to change what I'm doing. I think what you're doing is incredibly interesting. Would you spend a half hour telling me how you got there and the path you took and what you think of it? And each one of those interactions is going to be a learning experience and lead you someplace new. Yeah, that's amazing. And you know what? You are a prime example. And I'm realizing as you're saying it that I'm a prime example. My yep. background is television. And I, I'm a podcast coach. I teach women how to podcast. And so that, yes, podcasting was sort of scratching the surface 10, you know, 10 years ago. So you're absolutely right that I think if we're open-minded and we're able to innovate and just kind of be flexible... There are so many opportunities out there still. And people, other people, perfect strangers will help you get there if you're open and you want to learn. You could not have said in college, I want to be a podcast coach. <laughs> no, I couldn't. That was not a thing. <laughs> so if you've been in one industry for a while, you've probably not opened yourself up to some of those opportunities. Yeah, that's such a great point. One thing I ask all of my guests at the end of the show is what does it mean to you to 40 Thrive? 40 is like the birth 
of this new life. And so when I talk about 40 Thrive, it's like 40 is just the beginning. So what does it mean to you, Lisa, to 40 Thrive? I think it means to me sort of a whole second beginning. You and I were talking about it a few minutes ago. We made a lot of choices in our lives because of constraints that we had. At 40, we know ourselves so much better than we possibly could have when we were in college. And we might have made a different set of choices. And now maybe we can't make them today. Maybe the kids are still in middle school or still in high school and we are, you know, we need to live where we're living and we need the paycheck that we're earning. But it's time to start thinking about what those will be, even if we can't make those decisions now. Because we know ourselves so much better, because we have so much better information, it's a chance to make a decision we might not have made earlier and make one that lasts for a lifetime. That's absolutely perfect. And I have to mention one thing before we go. You are so modest. So when I reached out to you and I'm asking for bios and this and that, and you're sending me all of the things for Grown and Flown, and I'm like, what about you? What about Lisa? And you're just... You you let the brand speak for itself, but you haven't even mentioned the fact that you are one of People Magazine's 25 women changing the world in 2017. So is that when you thought, oh, I'm going to start this grown and flown, could you have even imagined that that would be part of it? Not in a million years. So we started the group, honestly, Mary Dell and I thought we would get 20 or 30 people together, probably people that we knew in real life, and we would kind of chat online. There's over 120,000 people. We're getting thousand or more people a week coming into the group. I could not have imagined that there was such a need to discuss some of these important issues. Um, so no, it's really exciting and really fun. It's amazing. It, yeah. So, but you're so modest and you're so, and I, I find that with a lot of my guests, they're like, oh yeah, that thing I did. And it's like, uh, I would be screaming it from the rooftop. <laughs> well, thank you for screaming for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lisa, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on the book. People can go to the show notes and it will link to the book. Um, it's also on Audible. Yes, we just recorded some of it. It was really fun. I've never done that before. So yeah, we were down in their studios recording the book. It was fun. That's great. Well, congratulations. I can't wait to read it. And I highly recommend all of my listeners get it as well. Lisa, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. To join Grown and Flown Parents or get the new book, check out the show notes at 40thrive.com forward slash episode 36. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Share with a friend. You know the one. She's really struggling through this transition right now. And until next time, take care and keep thriving. Spring has sprung, and with the change of seasons, sometimes comes an increase in vitality. If you're feeling in the mood for a little more personal time, may I suggest Coconu. Coconu is all about providing clean and natural ingredients when you're enjoying your most intimate moments, with or without a partner. Naturally safe products developed by people who are obsessed with quality. Get 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash Coconu. That's 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash Coconu.